A warm welcome to Linnean Society's Nature Reader for this month. And we have Ronald von Huxen, and I'm pretty sure I got that wrong. And I apologize for that, Ronald. I can't do the Dutch accent. But um, this is based on Ronald's work in the south, in the southeast of Amsterdam. And of he's been working with <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he's been working for 40 years um, as an yeah. amateur researcher, but he's pretty much an expert. His research has revolved around the little owl's distribution, numbers, reproduction, and menu. And Ronald is the chairman of the National Owl Working Group Stone. In his capacity, he works a lot with national partners, such as BirdLife International, and so on. He's also the author of two books on the little owl and the co-author of the English monograph. Actually, his second edition of a book on little owls will be published in September, which will release in the UK and the USA. The first edition was published in 2007, right, Ronald? Yes, that's and correct. It's, and it's been a long while. But I have um, perused Ronald's presentation, and there are some lovely videos. Some of them are a bit long, but if you're patient, I'm pretty sure you will enjoy the stories that Ronald has brought to us about the little owls. And if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, which you will see at the bottom toolbar and not in the chat box. This is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as usual. I will be posting little bits and pieces, uh, links in the chat box, on our newsletter, on our videos, on our YouTube channel, etc. So keep an eye on that. And that's it from me. And over to Ronald and the Little Owls. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Padma. Also for the opportunity. Uh, I think it's very nice to to share uh, my passion for this uh, this little owl. As uh, Padma already says, um, I we started with uh, the research some forty years ago. So we have. Uh, lots of data and lots of interesting stories uh, to share. Um, I called my uh, presentation, The Little Owl, Small But Brave. And I start with a video that will show how brave a little owl really is. Uh, what we see is, um, um, the images from Berleef de Lente, it's the Dutch counterpart of uh, Springwatch. And hey, did... Ronald, I, I think the video is not playing. Can you? No, no, that's, that's, that's correct. Uh, I started okay, okay. in Sorry. a few seconds. <laughs> um, uh, so it's Berleef de Lente, the Dutch counterpart from uh, Springwatch, and it's June the 3rd of this year. And there are four young, and they are 28 days old, waiting in a nest box for one of the parents to bring food. So that's the situation at this, when the video starts. There comes the male and look what he is bringing. It's a very large prey. It's a, a, a young hare, but he falls off. A hare actually is a very large prey for little owls. And there is a second one. I'm not sure whether it's a new one or the old one, but there's an, at least. And now he's trying to bring it, to put it, pull it into the nest entrance. And the young are really hungry. He's getting some help. And this is the, uh, the, the, the male is bringing uh, a small insect and the, the female is trying to pull the, the hair in, inside into the nest box. And these are the young and they are eating from, from, from the hair. As I, as I said, it's a very large prey. Normally, they, um, they eat mice, and one of them finds a mouse corner, while the other young fight uh, about the hare. He tries to 
see the mouse. And he goes in in one. It will take some time, but... And of course, he, the tail is at last, the last part. And he has to take a deep breath. And there, there he goes. So this is a little insight inside of the nest box. And um, this is why I call the little owl uh, small but brave. An adult male at this time of year weighs 100 to 160 grams and a young hare at least half of that. So catching such large prey is quite a job. And you have to think twice before venturing on such enormous prey. But first, let me tell you something about the little owl itself. It's a small owl, uh, naked, I mean, without feathers, uh, not much bigger than a blackbird, some 20, about 20, 21 centimeters long. In the Netherlands and also in England, it's the smallest owl, but in Europe, there are two species that are even smaller, the Scots owl and the pygmy owl. The last one is the smallest. Um, it does not have a distinct nocturnal lifestyle. With some luck, you will see it during the day, especially in the early morning or in the last hour before sunset, when it sits on a pole or a ridge of a shed. In the breeding season, it even hunts during the day on foals. So that's unlike, for instance, a barn owl or a tawny owl, which only you can only see at night. Uh, and of course, little owls, uh, are also nocturnal and he is also superbly equipped for hunting at night. Um, there is no difference between males and uh, and females. They look they look the same and perhaps surprisingly, but in owls, females are a bit larger than males, just like in birds of prey. Think of hawk and sparrow hawk. This is called reverse sexual dimorphism. And as you can see in the graph, in little owls, however, difference, uh, differences are small and there is even some overlap. In the breeding season, the differences are bigger. Males take care of prey supply from the time the female starts incubating until the nestlings are two weeks old. This takes a lot of energy, and as a consequence, he, as a consequence, he quickly loses weight. Little owls are strictly monogamous. Most pairs stay once formed together for the rest of their lives. They are also strongly tied to the place where they once settled. Moves are very rare. Their habitat is relatively small, a radius of 250 meters around the nest, that's all. And young little owls also prefer to stay close to their parents after they become independent. In our study area, males, male juveniles settle about on an average of 2.5 kilometers from their birthplace and females on average 10 kilometers. So based on the male, you can, on the, on the weight, you can never tell for sure whether you're dealing with a male or a female. However, recent research shows that there may be a difference in the size and the shape of the head. Um, in the top row, we see males, and in the bottom, we see females. And if you look closely, uh, maybe you notice that females have a slightly larger and flatter head than males, who, have, who tend to have a slightly smaller and a bit rounder head. Especially when you hold both side by side, um, you can see the difference. It's yet too early to base a reliable gender distinction on this, but we are looking further into it. So it would be very helpful if we could discriminate uh, the sexes by the, how they look. 
Um, the little owl has a wide range from Western Europe until the east of the east of China. It even inhabits the northern coastline of Africa from Morocco to Somalia. Uh, so far, 13 to 14 subspecies have officially been um, recognized, three of which we find in Europe. That is uh, Noctua in, in, in the middle in middle of Europe and Vidali in, uh, in Western Europe and in Spain. And there is Indigena in the Balkans. However, further research is needed to better understand their exact distribution, especially in North Africa and in Asia. They inhabit a wide variety of landscapes. For Delhi, uh, the, the, the subspecies in our region, for instance, uh, can be found in small cultivated landscapes in Western Europe, but also in Spain in the Dehesas, olive groves, and pseudo steps in Spain and Portugal. So it's, and that are really open landscapes. Um, the subspecies lilies can be found in Syria and Israel, where it inhabits semi deserts and other open landscapes. And Lidloe, for instance, inhabits mountainous regions in the northern of India and Tibet, where it breeds in rock gravities. So it's all the same little owl. Um, yeah, where do they breed in Western Europe? Um, in the Netherlands, they traditionally breed in natural cavities in high stem apple trees and pollard willows, but also in all kinds of human structures. On the left, we see photos from uh, Piet Fuchs collection from the second half of the 1970s in the Betuwe, a region once famous for its high stem apple orchards. These are historical photos. The orchards have since, been, have since been cut down and have given way to low trunk fruit trees that no longer create cavities. This also applies for a large part to the pollard willows in the photo on the right. And old sheds have been demolished and have made way for new ones that little owls can no longer use for nesting. We estimate that nowadays some 40 to 50% of the Dutch population of the little owl breeds in a nest box. Many nest boxes are placed on a horizontal branch in a tree. In this way, the young can easily walk in and out, something they like to do when they reach 30 days of age. But also nest boxes are placed in barns. Here provides the plank the possibility to go in and out. And in places, and it's rather uh, new, in places um, suitable in terms of habitats, where there is no adequate tree or barn, uh, we do mount a nesting box on an iron pole. So there's always a possibility to uh, make a nest box for a little owl. But there's still a small part of the population breeds in natural cavities in trees. Here you can see a few examples. Notice how small the entrance to the cavity is. You may wonder how suitable this kind of cavity actually are. The ground area is often very small and the young will uh, of necessity often have to sit on the top of each other. A larger proportion will take advantage of the opportunities offered by buildings of all kinds. How they can find suitable places is remarkable. The picture shows the entrance to a nest cavity under the roof of a renovated farmhouse. During the renovation, a hole under the windspring was accident accidentally forgotten to be sealed, and through that hole, a little owl can enter a space between the roof covering and the roof boarding. It's a perfect and safe place to breed. Um, they will settle for almost anything as long as it allows them to breed relatively undisturbed. They have been breeding in this small shed for several years, most of the time successfully. And they are now completely uh, used to the residents. They can uh, 
quietly take photos and videos from some distance while the owls sit outside uh, the roof. And I have some of you to show. So it's quite curious to see what's going on. And let's also go for this one. He's a bit older, a bit later. And that's a typical manner when they see how they move, when they see something that is drawing their attention. Um, little owls have a remarkable, have a remarkable breathing strategy um, compared to most other owls. Before, but before I zoom into that, first something about nesting itself. Only females breed. During egg laying, they develop a brood patch, a bare spot on the abdomen, where the feathers fall out. Feathers insulate and prevent heat transfer from the female to the eggs. So. You have to be without feathers at that place. This this is actually actually also the only moment you, where you can distinguish a female from a male with 100% certainty. Once a female is in, uh, incubating firmly, she's almost unflappable. Um, in the picture on the right, there's a female just stays in place while I lift the roof tile she is sitting under. I can slide my hand under her to count the number of eggs with my fingers, and then lower the roof tile. She just continues incubating if it's the most normal thing in the world to do. Barn owls and most other owls start breeding immediate, immediately at the first egg. As a result, there is a big age difference between the young. If a barn owl, which is not unusual for the species, lays seven eggs, the difference between the first and the last young is as much as two weeks. Not difficult to guess what happens when few mice are delivered for a while. Little owls do things differently. They usually do start breeding until all the eggs have been laid. As a result, the young has short lay after another, usually on the same day. Consequently, there's hardly any size difference between the young. You can imagine what happens when a mouse is delivered and everyone is hungry. The picture shows a nest with originally five eggs. Three have just hatched, but the young's downy plumage has already dried from three of them. Number four has just wriggled out of the, of, out of the nest and the downy plumage has yet to dry. Number five is still in the egg, but will be coming in a short time. And four weeks later, we three, three of the young from the same nest, 28 days old. In terms of sight and weight, they are not much different. So quite unlike, uh, for instance, barn owls. Um, this graph shows uh, the egg laying and um, what we see is uh, in the red, red uh, columns we see um, when the day when an egg is, uh, uh, is laid and um, the, the interval between two con consecutive eggs are 55 hours and from the first egg the female incubates for an inc increasing number of hours every day until the last egg is laid, she is absent at night. Only the second day after she has laid the last egg, does she brood more than 28 hours. From that moment on, she is firmly breathing. The fact that she spends several hours on the eggs every day from the start ensures that the first laid eggs also get a warm start um, and that the embryo development on the eggs is more or less equal. The first laid eggs also would otherwise have cooled down considerably by the time she actually starts incubating. The incubation uh, period lasts 31 days from the first egg and 25 days from the last egg. In 
In the Netherlands, uh, the average clutch size is 3.9x. It ranges from 3.5 in bad fall years till 4.5 in good fall years. Clutches with 5x are not uncommon. Even clutches with 6x with six X sometimes occur, especially in excellent fall years. Very occasionally, we find a nest with 7 or 8. Sometimes, very occasionally, extremely large clutches are found. This clutch of 12 dates, dates from of 12 eggs, dates from this year. They fit exactly into the egg carton. None of the 12 egg hatched. That's the reason why I could, could collect them. Um, and none of them were fertilized. Clutches like this, um, and also clutches with more than 12 eggs, um, come from two females breeding together in the next box. And for sure you can tell because both, they have a brood patch. And it is something that happens occasionally. And the reason why is still a bit unclear. And most of these clutches, which is two females, they do fail. But sometimes um, such a double class Dutch, uh, does succeed. And the record stands at 11 eggs and Elfion, of which 10 fledged. And you see a picture of it. And uh, yeah, think of the, the poor male, because he is in the first two weeks uh, all on his own responsible for bringing in the food. So he has uh, a hard job to do. Um, at this nest too, we found two breeding females and uh, the six young of this nest could clearly be could clearly be divided in two in two groups, and there was an age difference of four days between these two groups, indicating that both groups had a different had a different mother. This is a picture uh, about our new uh, from our new books, and uh, you can see uh, the development of the nestlings. The young are developing at a breakneck speed. On their date of birth, they weigh um, 10 to 11 grams. And 12 days later, they reach 100 grams, 10 times their birth weight in, 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 in 12 days. And 14 days later, they reach their fletching weight, about between 440 and 150 grams. The white dawn down from the first days gives way to the gray down around day five. And then the egg tooth also fails off, falls off. And the egg tooth is a small uh, tooth here and in, in the, uh, the point of the, of the beak. And it's used to open uh, the egg from the inside. Um, when they were born, the, eggs are, the, the eyes are closed. And between 10, day 10 and day 12, they open their eyes. And around day 14, the wing feathers start to grow. About around day 30, they are ready to fly, to fledge. Only then does the tail really start to grow. Around 35 days or so, they leave the nest, but depending on the situation, they return for days, sometimes even for weeks. Um, the weight is actually very dependent on the foot, situa foot situation. I come to talk that later. Uh, in years with lots of mice, they can be 20 to 30% heavier, uh, and in bad years, 20 to 30% lighter. The average number of nestlings in successful nests in the Netherlands is 2.9. It, it ranges from 2.1 in bad fall years to 3.6 in good fall years. This year, uh, we lined up the reproduction over the past 25 years in the Netherlands, and both clutch size and number of young showed no clear trend. This is good news because it means that the reproduction is stable uh, and probably not a limiting factor in population stability. However, there are large differences between the years. I will come back to this later in more detail. 
What the figure also shows is that on average, there is a loss of 1.6 eggs of young from egg, from egg to fledgling. So you start with 3.9 uh, eggs and you end up with 2.3 nestlings on average. But the first losses occur in the egg phase because not all eggs hatch. Once eggs have hatched, the first week is the most vulnerable. After that, losses seldom occur. However, the biggest loss factor, factor is formed by nests that fail altogether. The causes are different, but they are diverse. Predation by stone martens is certainly an important factor, but deaths one of but, but deaths of one of the parents also occurs regularly. Sometimes none of the eggs hatch or disturbance occurs. On average, 25% of the nests fail. Um, this was, for instance, uh, an example. This was what I saw when I opened uh, the nest box, a dead little owl, a female. And when I took her out, I also found a dead young and an unhatched egg. The cause of her death could not be determined, but why the nest was failed, why the nest failed was uh, was clear. This is another nest that was located on the corrugated sheets of a shed, and it sunk through the bottom under the weight of the female and the young, and the young and the, the one egg fell on the ground, and all the young uh, died. So that was a very poor situation. What do little owls eat? Yeah, sufficient food is an important life condition for any living being, especially if there are nestlings to feed. For adequate protection, it is therefore important to have a proper knowledge on the diet of little owls, especially what nestlings are fed with. As you probably know, the little owl is not in indigenous, indigenous for to England. In the late 19th century, several attempts were made to introduce the species. They used Italian and Dutch birds, and the latter attempts were successful, and since the, then the little owl conquered a great part of the UK. In the first part of the last century, bird lovers and hunters and poultry farmers in England uh, were very concerned about the impact of the little owl on the local songbird populations and feared for their game and poultry chicks. Therefore, the British Trust for Ontology commissions Mrs. Hibbert A. Ware uh, to initiate a national study on the diet of little owls. Her report of the little owl food inquiry was published in 1936-1937. You see a copy of it on the left. And as it was referred to in the report, um, it rapidly became a bird of evil repute, and widespread marches, uh, charges were made against it of serious depredation on songbirds and game and poultry tricks. Um, in order to find out what the diet was, she examined 2,460 pellets, 76 nests and larders, and 51 gizzards, collected from all over the country. And the results were the prevalent food of all times of year consists of insects and rodents. Birds are an important food constituent during the nesting season. Most commonly birds are take most commonly Taken birds are stir starlings, house sparrows, blackbirds, and sun tresses. So that was about 80 years ago, 90 years ago. Um, this is um, the, the results of Mrs. Hibbert, where we found only partly matches the results of 11 camera observations that yielded a total of 30. Uh, 3,686 items. We were able to follow a nest, several nests by uh, by cameras, and uh, volunteers registered every prey that was brought in. Uh, what we found was that insects and their larvae account for almost 80 percent 
of total prey. Amongst these, um, May beetles are prominent with 22% of the total. Um, if you, uh, so yes, you could call uh, little owls insectivores, like big tits. If you include moths, the proportion of insects is even as high as 93%. Mice make up only a small proportion, 3.6. If you, if you include fruits, 3.7. Birds only account for 0.3% of the prey supply. So calling a little owl a mouse or a bird eater seems a bit exaggerated, at least in the breeding season. Um, but if we do not look at the numbers, but consider the weight of each prey, the supply based on biomass, it's quite a different story. Insects, and their larvae then make up a little bit over a third of the prey. Mice and voles are responsible for more than a quarter of the supply, as do earthworms. This shows how important both are for growing nestlings. Later, I will discuss in detail the role of mice and voles. Now, as promised, to back to the May beetle and the earthworm. May beetles are fascinating uh, uh, insects. They live only on sandy soils, and but they come in great numbers, very great numbers. Uh, the grubs spend three to four years underground and then do a lot of damage to young plantings and lawns. For this reason, many people dislike them. They are an important food source for blackbirds and hedgehogs, for example. And adults are on the menu of magpies, crows, and even dogs and chickens like them, and thus do little owls. Males and females are easy to tell apart based on the feeders. Those of a, fe of a male are much larger than those of a female. So the one on the left is a male and the one on the right is a female. As I said, little owls like May beetles very much. And this is what we see in the graph is the supply of cockshavers at one nest, one season. The number of cockshavers per day. The numbers are huge, reaching as high as nearly 80 specimens on May 13. A total of 1,380 Cockshafers were brought in in 40 days, an average of nearly 31 per day, eight per day per young. As you can imagine, as you can imagine, cockshafers are an important addition to the diet of mice, earthworms, and other insects. Now to the earthworms. Um, you have to look closely. Um, the earthworm got a bit entangled between the two owls. Uh, but they are also an important food, so, food uh, source for numerous animals, from blackbirds to buzzards and from hedgehogs to badgers. They are also a welcome addition to the menu for little owls. The species most likely to be called is Lunchestis, the cumbrous worm or the lobworm. They are hefty worms that, grow, that can go up to 25 centimeters long. The surface at night they, they, they surface at night to forage and mate, making them an easy prey to catch. In dry periods, deeper in the style, almost unreachable, but sometimes can be pulled up by watering the lawn. This graph shows the total number of earthworms fed during the juvenile period in 11 camera recordings. So the total of them. And what is striking, is that in the first 10 days, hardly any earthworms are fed. The numbers in that period are insignificant. We think this is a deliberate decision by the parents. Earthworms contain a relatively large amount of water and the abdomen accumulates a lot of sand and feces. These are all ingredients with no nutritional value, which do, which do need to be excreted. It costs a lot of, it costs a small stick, lots of energy, more energy than it, they yield. If a lot of earthworms have been fed, you can smell the sharp ammonia odor in the nest. The nest 
links in such an nest are often dirty and malnourished. So stone owl parents are not are therefore not only brave but also smart. Don't feed many earthworms, especially not when your kids are little. Another part of our research into what nestlings are fed consists of counting and naming prey and prey remains in the nest. We do this since 1998, so we have uh, this time 26 years in a row. Especially in the first 10 days, so many mice are often brought in that they cannot be eaten all immediately. A small or large stockpile then sometimes develops. Counting these in a consistent manner gives an impression of the quantity and quality of the number of mice and other vertebrate prey. What we see on the picture is a nest under a roof with four young little owls and a huge supply of mice. There were so many they, that they had to be stacked. To sort out uh, the, the species, we had to um, take them out of the nest and look at them one by one. So these are the first, and, and told there were 35 altogether, 32 wood mice and three common foals. When we came, like, when we came a week later, all of them were eaten. Here's another um, picture. Um, and another example of the stock we found in the nest box. This time an owl with a rather more sophisticated taste. Because on the top we find a waterfall, it's a very big uh, 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 fall. Then four bank falls, 15 common falls, as much as 10 wood mice, and one house mice making up a total of 31 mice. So that is what we can find uh, in one nest box at one moment. Over the past 26 years, we have found a total of 5,690 5, prey. Mice and foals we found the most, almost 85% of the total. Just over four percent were for birds. I will come to that to that species in a moment. Here you see the species different dif uh, differentiated per group, and as you can see, uh, wood mouse and the common foal are the most important prey. But even now and then they catch, they, they catch a bat or a rabbit. And as we saw, a hare. But then it always are young hares. Um, to the birds, we find all sorts of birds. For instance, this is, uh, um, these are six uh, um, starlings. Here are five uh, uh, common sparrows. And this is a, a yellow hammer. It's a very rare species. And this was also quite remarkable, a common parakeet. And a jay. These are all the birds we found in the nest box, 443 uh, in total. And as you can see, common starlings, backbirds, sparrows are the most, uh, most caught uh, uh, birds. But even um, uh, we had some uh, red stead and a carrion crow, uh, a gray partridge. So it's quite an ontologist, our little owl. Of course, you know the big five the lion, the leopard, the black rhinoceros the African bush elephants and the African buffalo. But here in the Netherlands, we have a local variant of this, the big four. And that's the bank foal, the common foal, the house mouse, and the wood mouse. These are the mice that are most important for little ants.
If we correct the total of these mice for the number of nest boxes visited during the period when the young are still small, less than 10 days old, we get a figure that allows us to compare the years. What we see is that the number of mice can vary a lot from year to year. It varies for, for an average from an average of one um, in uh, 2004 to more than 12 in 2014. Yeah, like, uh, pronounced good years also were 2014 with especially a large number of wood mice and 2019 with lots of field foals. Both poor years were 2004, 2009, 2011, and then after this series, good years, 2020. I will take a close look uh, to the two most important species, the wood mouse and the common foal. Um, the common foal, as its name is suggests, is a common foal. Its habitat is meadows, fallow land, and agricultural. Its diet consists mainly of grass and agricultural crops. It's a species that is active not only at night, but also during the day. That's why, for example, you can see kestrels hooving over on a meadow during the day. They are looking for common foals. Little owls can do that too, but hoover, uh, hoovering, but they don't do it very often. It costs them too much energy. Mice and foals are usually caught from a grid post or a low, other low pads. That's, more, that's a more easy way. This is really interesting. This the picture shows the uh, supply of common foals in a nest observed with cameras in 2020. It was a very poor, uh, poor year for foals. During the time the female was incubating, hardly any foals were brought in, nor during the first days of the nestling period. But from May 8, the numbers rise sharply to at most as 17 on May 10. Suddenly it's over and only one to three are brought in every day. Some days, even not even one. What is happening here? The answer is actually quite simple, mowing. On May 5 and May 7, the meadows around the nest were mowed and the foals lost their cover. For a short period, there were plenty of them and the little owls could catch almost as many foals as they wanted. And they did. A few days later, the abundance was over and the supply fell back to the low numbers from before. Conclusion, in a year with few foals, little owls are very dependent on the timing of mowing. Some nests are lucky, others are unlucky. So timing is very important. But how do you, as being a little owl, know when a farmer is going to mow? You don't. This was 2023, um, a year with relatively high numbers of foals. Already in the, during incubation, many foals were brought in, something that went, continued when they were young. Again, we see a peak at the time of mowing over here, but it is much less pronounced than in 2020. As much as 140 foals were brought in that year. That's not even that much more than in 2020, when 115 were delivered. The difference is that the supply in 2023 was spread over the whole period, while in 2020, it very, it very much peaked in a short period after mowing. And that makes it vulnerable. Then, to the wood mouse, it inhabits forests, grasslands, and cultivated fields, and it, the diet consists mainly of seeds of oak, beet, and hazel. This is an oak. You might well know that. This one is perhaps 150 years old, and it stands 200 feet, 250 meters from my house, at the entrance of, to an old cemetery. It's a very beautiful uh, a tree and I walk past it uh, several times a week on my way to the center of the village. In autumn 2021, I took this photo of the grassy area under the tree. It's immediately striking. 
No acorns at all. Not one. The same place a year earlier. The number of acorns was so large that they seemed almost uncountable. Everywhere you looked, there were acorns, thousands of them. Though there was a big difference between both shares. What did this mean for the number of wood mice we found in the nest box in the year afterwards, in the breeding season? In 2021, and we found 190 wood mice at 94 nests, an average of 2.12. In 2020, we, uh, 20, uh, 2020, we found only 27 in 72 nests, an average of 0 0.38. So there's a big difference um, between uh, a good in, in, in a year with lots of acorns and when there are very few acorns. What does this all mean uh, for the condition of the nestlings? Having lots or having few mice to eat? When we ring the young, we use um, wing length and weight to determine the condition of each young. The photo on the left we measure the wing lengths, and on the, on the, the, the photo below, you can see a um, young that is weight on the, on, the, on the balance. We calculate the condition um, by dividing, dividing the measured weight by the expected weight at that, at, at that age. All young are given the age of the young with the largest wing. For age and condition, we use the tables from the manual on breeding biology research that we produced in 2011. This manual is used by field workers throughout the country. So that gives us a, a, a good, a good uh, thing to compare between uh, diverse regions in the Netherlands. Um, as you can see, our little owls are happy to cooperate. Uh, now to the results. In a good year, um, in a good mouse year, nestlings, nestlings are substantially heavier than in a year with few mice, where 150 grams is the norm. This heavy weight almost weighs 200 grams. My co-worker, Pascal, is as surprised as I am. This is our heaviest so far, a fitness index of 1.4. In this way, we determined the condition of all juveniles from 1998 onwards. As a result, we can now compare 26 years, and this provides a nice overview of the difference between the years, a total of almost 4,000 measurements. The first decade of this century was characterized by below zero, below average conditions, and the second decade by above average conditions. Big question, of course, is what causes this difference? This becomes clear if we correlate the number of mice, let's say the big four, with the condition of nestlings. And then we see a significant correlation where 70% of fitness is determined by the number of mice. So, the more mice, the heavier the juveniles. And this illustrates the importance of mice in prey supply to the nestlings in a very clear way. An average mouse weighs 90 grams, for which perhaps 25 insect larvae have to be caught. Flying once with a mouse in your claws or 25 times with a larva in your beak, uh, well, that makes a difference. Like if you go up and down the supermarket 25 times to do your shopping instead of once fill a full shopping cart. Um, by the way, notice that uh, you see it in the, the graph on the, on the right, that little owls catch not only adult mice, but also little ones, 
had come to play above the ground for the first time in their lives, or up to pregnant mothers on the right. Um, I have come to talk, uh, I've come uh, to an end of this talk, um, but a final uh, finding I want to share with you, and that is men are screwed. On the left, we see a foe, a, a male foe, and on the right, there's a female. And more than two out of three mice we caught, we found in the nest box, belonged to the male sex. So that raises the questions, do men uh, taste more delicious or do little owls dislike my, uh, male mice more? No, it's much, much simpler. Males spend more time above the ground during the time females are nursing their young and therefore, and therefore are a greater risk. In biology, this is called the risky man, the risky male hypothesis. Um, and now I have to ask uh, Padma, uh, do we have time for this video? Yeah, go ahead, Ronald. We'd love to yes. watch it. Okay. Yes. Well, it's a very remarkable situation. Uh, it's 2017, and uh, what we see is um, what happened when a, a, a female uh, little owl was caught outside the nest box by stone marten. And uh, mostly that means uh, the end of the nest. And um, but in this this special situation, the ma the male uh, did his very best to save the nest, and it gives a uh, surprisingly insight into the life of a breeding pairs of little owls. No, I have to. Yes. The young are a few days old, and the male was, of the female was a little while outside, um, and she comes back. And she sits at east. At ease. But eight minutes later, she is alarmed. She hears something outside the nest bucket. It's a cell. It's the male. And he is warning her because what is happening? Stone Martin. He tries to enter the nest box because obviously he smells there is something to eat inside. But he is also attacked by the by the owls. This box is Martin proof, so he cannot enter the next box. But he doesn't know that, of course. Second and third attack of one of the owls. He doesn't give up because he's hungry and he knows for sure there's something in that mess box. So he's doing his very best to get in. And then a fourth attack, and 
what happens outside the camera, uh, yeah, uh, uh, alas, we cannot see that, but we believe that it was the female that was attacked by the stone marten. And this is a few hours later, a quarter past three. The female yet did not return. This is the male with a little prey in its beak. And you see it's, he is still a bit frightened. He does not know what would have what happened and afraid to go in. You can hear the young begging for food. So at least at last he goes in. But he still doesn't trust it. And then at 4.17, he comes in and he tries to feed the young with the larva. But that's not his usual job. Feeding uh, the young is, is uh, really a task for the female. And yeah, you see how clumsy he is, he is doing this. doesn't work. Try it again, perhaps. At 9 a.m., he has entered the nest box and he is sitting on the juveniles. Instantly, he knows he has to keep them warm, otherwise they starve from the cold. And what then happens is really remarkable. Uh, we have not seen that before. He is picking a mouse from the other corner and he's tearing the mouse apart and feeding little pieces to the young. Normally, that's only what females do. We have never seen a male doing this. And you can see he's not used to do this. He goes a bit clumsy. But what is, um, yeah, the big difficulty here, um, he has to do uh, both things. He has to be in the nest box and keeping the juveniles warm and feed him. And at the same time, he has to go to hunt. And that's a situation um, yeah, that makes it very difficult for him. Doing both things at the same time is almost impossible. But he is doing his best. And the young are very hungry and because they haven't eaten for several hours now, middle of the night. And the day after, alas, the young, they die one by one. Not that there's not enough food, but uh, yeah, the male is not equipped to do, uh, to feed and to keep them warm and to hunt.
And this actually is what no one has seen any owl doing. It makes it very special. He's really trying his best. But as I already said, one by one, the young die, despite the efforts of the male to bring in new food. <clears throat> one mouse after the other, but what is failing is a female to feed them. And this was broadcast as live at that moment, and people were looking at it, and um, yeah, it was a very um, bad moment for most for for, for uh, quite a lot of people. So in the end, all the juveniles died. This is the last one. And then what happened that shocked a lot of people, he starts eating from one of the juveniles. And why that is, is still unclear, but we have seen them doing this um, very often. And on May 25, four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning, he sends out a signal that he is a widow and uh, he is in urge for a new wife. So he's uttering his mating call. And the same day, a few hours later, Still eating little pieces of a chicken. And then he grabs one chick in the beak and brings it outside the nest box. And he drops it somewhere. And also the second. And, the third. and that night, uh, one day later, he already found a new female and he's showing her where the nest box is and where she has to put her, her eggs. So this is a few days after the first female uh, lost her life. So they are mourning, but not too long. Um, alas, it was too late in the in the in the season um, for a new for a new uh, uh, nest. But the year the year later, the, the pair they succeeded in in uh, in bringing up a new young. So um, if my talk got you interested in the little owl and you want to know more, um, there's good news. Uh, in the course of September, Cambridge University Press will release our new monograph on the little owl, um, as well as the latest up on our knowledge of this amazing animal. It will also feature great illustrations by Joris de Raad. So highly recommend it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ronald. I must say that was not the ending I expected to that story. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> at all. Uh, do you know what happened to the first female? Did you ever find well, the body? I went, I went looking for her the day after to see if I can uh, spot her or find some remains of her, but I didn't find anything. What I suppose is the stone martyr took her to his own young. Okay. And does this happen often, the attack by stone martins? And how, and how is the nest box stone martin proof? Uh, is it the size of the hole? Yeah, the size of the hole is important. It has to be not too big. And uh, there are different holes inside the nest box. You cannot see that from the outside, but from the inside, there are three holes. And the stone martin has to crawl uh, through all three holes. And it makes it very difficult for him because he is okay. too big. He's really too big. But what is really a, a surprising, the new female, uh, she turned out to be uh, the girl from next door. <laughs> Only a year before. So maybe she was just waiting, you yeah, know, for her job. Maybe, maybe, she, was, maybe she was waiting. Maybe <laughs> she helped. Uh, she had a little eye on, on, uh, on her uh, neighbor uh, the year after, the year before. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ronald, I'm going to get to the questions. There are lots of them. Uh, and I'm going to put a few of them together, which are similar. There's a couple of questions about the little owls in the UK and why they burrow underground. Uh, do you know, is it because the UK has very few, you know, forest area left? Is that why they go underground? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what you, what you do you mean by underground? The burrow underground, the little owls in the UK. Yes, 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 but that's uh, that's quite quite common for uh, little owls. Okay. They use uh, rabbit holes, and for instance, on the other side of the ocean, we have a nephew of the little owl, the burrowing owl, and yeah, you, it's already in his name that he lives in burrows of rabbits and and badgers and hedgehog and and uh, prairie dogs. So that's really a common uh, behavior for little owls. Okay, I see. Um, there's a question here from Carol. In England, little, little owls sometimes breed in rabbit holes. Does it happen in Netherlands as well? Yeah, and not today anymore, but in former days they do. In, in exactly in, in the coastal dunes, there were many, uh, were lots of uh, little owls that bred in rabbit holes. But as the the rabbit um, has declined very much, there are no not so much more uh, rabbit holes anymore these days. Okay, I see. Um, Craig Thompson has asked, in areas where you have martens, whether stone, pine, or beach, do yeah. you have to place the owl boxes higher to avoid predation, or is it just, no, no, you know, that the boxes... Higher is not uh, the solution. Uh, um, all martens are excellent uh, climbers, and it doesn't matter whether it's three meters or five meters or even 10 meters, they climb... Uh, they smell it, I believe, and then they do their very best to uh, to reach the nest. Right. Um, have there been any introduction attempts other than the UK and New Zealand? Uh, not that I know of, but in some parts of uh, they are now uh, in in Denmark because the then the the population in Denmark has almost um, has declined to there are maybe two or three. Uh, no, well, let's just 10 or 15 little owls left in Denmark, and they're planning a reintroduction with German owls. Right. Um, Nicola King has asked, how far do they go for food? Uh, she said that yeah. she yeah. knows there are hares about near the owls here about a kilometer away. Yeah. Um, well, the farther you have to go, uh, the worse it is. So they mostly hunt uh, within their territory, as a, as with range up to two hundred and fifty meters. If they have to fly more with a very small prey, it makes it very inefficiently. You can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, does weight at fledgling stage affect the subsequent survival of the fledglings? Um, could you? Um, yes. Yeah. Does does the uh, the weight of the fledgling does that determine whether they survive that's, or not? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are not. We are now looking into this. We have lots of data and we examine them. But we believe indeed that the weight of the fledgling is an important factor in the survival. Yeah, for sure. Okay. 
And how do you think the owl managed to kill a jay? Was it a sick bird? <laughs> yeah, we do not know for sure that the jay was alive, of course. It could be, it could have been a road, fig, a road victim or something like that. Right. Because a, a uh, jay is, of course, very, very, uh, yeah, uh, challenge for a little owl. Yeah. Do you know if it is only little owl chicks that suffer poor development because of the large numbers of earthworm or would large numbers of earthworms affect other bird species as well? No, I, I think it's special um, um, for young uh, um, little owls from to, until they are a day of 10. And um, as for instance, other uh, blackbirds, they have, they have not, they, they eat earthworm, they live by, by earthworm, of course. But for some reason, little owls are not well um, uh, equipped for uh, eating earthworms and that's in that stage of life. Right. And what time of the year do they breed? Uh, okay. I did mention that, I remember. Uh, in, in Africa, they start uh, in the midst of April with the first okay. act. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in this as well. Have you linked any of the data to climate? For example, successful years for fledglings to either average temperature or days of rainfall? Uh, yeah, um, it's very difficult because we have too, too few data uh, for this from the past. We're looking yeah. into little owls only 20, 25 years, and we believe big things have happened uh, before. Um, yeah. So, and, and there's much fluctuation between the years. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. It's Vincent Smith, uh, who lives in Spain, and he's asked, uh, are they preyed upon by other birds of prey? Because they seem to make the, he lives in extra Madura, and he says they seem to make themselves easy prey by sitting on fences and walls. Yes, that's, that, that, that might be true. For instance, uh, uh, tawny owls are a big enemy of, uh, of uh, little owls, and uh, also buzzards, for instance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they, they do. have to be very aware of them. One last question before I close the lecture, and this is a good one to end on, I think, is what can landowners do to attract and support little owl populations? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good question, of course. Um, now, one of the things you can do is put up a nest box. If there, is, are there, if, if, if there are no natural cavities or barns, they can uh, nestle in. And the second most important, more important thing also is to give, uh, to create a good environment with a high biodiversity. So there have to be then, um, uh, not only different kind of insects, but also lots of mice and earthworms and frogs. The, the higher the diversity, the better uh, the little owl um, can, can live there. Yeah, I think that's a great message for anybody trying to attract biodiverse um, biodiversity onto their areas. And I think that's it. Thank you so much, Ronald. And to You're everyone welcome. else, this is Ronald's book, which will be out next month. And Ronald, if you send me the link, I can send it ahead um, yes, later on that. to yeah. everyone else. And that's it. If you have questions, do email me, events at linnaean.org. And thanks again to Ronald and for every to everyone else for attending. And have a great night. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Ronald. Bye.